increasingly split our time between the physical and the digital world as the entire uh, globe becomes connected, what happens in one country is only going to become more and more relevant to us, more so than any other time in history. Now, before we talk about how technology is transforming geopolitics and transforming our world, I think it's important to talk about where we came from and where we are before we even get into where we're going. So if we look at the sort of the, listening to the current discourse around the technological revolution, a lot of it centers around basic facts and figures. And I think that's a good place to start. So let's just look at the numbers. Since the year 2000, we've gone from roughly 361 million people connected to the internet to well over 2.5 billion now. And of those 2.5 billion people connected to the internet, about one and a half billion of them are connecting over smartphones. The story of mobile phones is even more remarkable. Since the year 2000, we've gone from 907 million mobile phones in circulation to now a little over 6.2 billion mobile phones. So think about it, those numbers are, are staggering. You have some countries like Russia and Tunisia where mobile phone subscriptions are around 300% because people have so many different SIM cards. Uh, people have so many, you know, the average you know, person has, in some cases, you know, four or five different phones. The story of video is an even more remarkable. It hasn't been around as long. Um, you have hours per month. It would take Hollywood 43 years to produce the same length content that is uploaded to YouTube in a single year. By the way, somebody at Google actually did that study and came up with that number. <laughs> Google has photographed more than 5 million miles of roads. To put that in perspective, that's enough to go to the moon 10 times and back. There's more SMSs, text messages sent in the United States alone than the entire population on Earth in a single day. So these numbers are incredible, and if you're not convinced by them, let's look at an age-old battle between communication and sanitation that I'm going to sort of invent for purposes of this talk. In India, you have more mobile phones in circulation than you have outhouses in the entire country. And if you remember, I said there's more than 6.2 billion mobile devices in circulation. There's actually only 4.2 billion toothbrushes in circulation. And last time I checked, mobile devices were significantly more expensive than uh, you know, a toothbrush. Um, and yet people just seem to always find a way to cover the cost and get their devices. Now, why do I tell you all these facts and figures? It's not to you know, try to impress you with retention of numbers and so forth, because I assure you, I assure you I've sort of uh, spit out these numbers many, many times. It's that most of the conversation around the technological revolution that is changing our world centers around ubiquity of devices, rates of connectivity, gadgetry, et cetera. And yet that tells you very little about what this technolog technological revolution is actually doing for the world. It doesn't answer the fundamental and most important question, which is why any of this matters. So if I tell you the entire world is connecting, but don't tell you why that's meaningful in some of the world's most complex places, then I'm not really painting a perfect picture for you of what a technological revolution is doing for this world. It's a great quote from Woody Allen, who's sort of a complicated figure, but has some good zingers, where he said 80% of life is showing up. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the context was in which he said this, but I like it. And so I spend a lot of my time traveling around the world, autocratic countries, unstable countries, trying to understand firsthand the ways in which technology is bettering the lives of individuals, complicating the lives of individuals, transforming relationships between people and their governments, um, creating uncertainty, um, creating new opportunities, and trying to make sense of all of it. And before I give you a handful of examples, I want to ask all of you a, a, a question. How many of you, at some point in your life, have sort of you know, imagined life being extremely difficult to, to sort of continue with without your mobile device? You know, to be honest, how many of you find it difficult to sort of imagine going through the motions without your mobile devices? Good. By the way, said that they would give up sex for an entire year before they would give up their mobile devices, and 42% said they would not wear shoes for somewhere between five to 10 years before they would give up their mobile devices. So again, you're not crazy. There's crazier people out there. Um, so let me sort of probe a little bit more. How many of you would be late for a meeting with your boss by, say, just five minutes if you left your phone in the other room and needed to go back and get it? Be honest, how many of you? OK, a lot of you. Now let me ask a different question. I'm from New York, so I sort of find the subway coming at me particularly terrifying. If you're in New York and you drop your mobile device in the subway and there's a subway coming at you, how many of you would jump onto the tracks to get your mobile device? There's sort of a decent chance you would get hit by the subway. By the way, there's always one or two, and we can talk afterwards. <laughs> OK, good. Nobody. This is, this is a very smart crowd. Um, 
you know, I asked you that uh, to go through that exercise because I want to tell you a story. I traveled to North Korea uh, about two years ago, a very strange place. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Truman Show or a Broadway play, it's sort of a combination of the two. Um, what's amazing is you know, North Korea is the least connected country on Earth, certainly the most totalitarian country on Earth. Um, do you know what the punishment is for being caught with a smuggled mobile device in North Korea? In some cases, you get the death penalty. So this notion of literally risking life and limb to gain access to, by the way, not even a smartphone, but a basic feature phone, is actually quite real in some places. And yet I was surprised to learn uh, more from dissidents than from actually being there that there's about a million smuggled uh, mobile circulating throughout North Korea, which means there's an unbelievable number of North Koreans who are literally risking their lives to be able to gain access to even a little bit of connectivity. And then of those million mobile percentage of the people using them are then going to the, you know, sort of up to the border with China to be able to get a signal so they can actually use it. And you talk to North Korean dissidents and you ask them sort of why they do this and they say it's all we've got. Before we had nothing, at least this gives us a chance to, to do something. And so every time you look at your mobile device, um, you know, I want you to just sort of imagine that the world where this device is so important and so meaningful that people will literally risk not just their lives, but the lives of family members to gain what little access it offers them. Now, I want to take you to another place, Afghanistan, which Ambassador Crocker certainly knows well. Uh, on my last trip there, um, I heard about two villages in Helmand province um, that were sort of reasonably close to each other. The first one had been attacked by the Taliban, and the first thing that the community did was send messages to the neighboring communities by text message letting them know that the Taliban was moving in. Um, so in that first village, um, the, uh, the Taliban learned the, the lesson, and when they went into the second village, they confiscated the mobile devices. Which is the village that you think was sort of quicker to revolt against the Taliban? It was the village where they took the mobile devices. The next place I want to take you to is Libya. On a trip to Libya, heard an amazing story about uh, during the bombing campaign just before Muammar Gaddafi was killed, there were Libyan schoolgirls who used in order to find the safe passageway to school, who literally used Google Maps to plot where the bombs were falling, where the violence was happening, so they could continue going to school amidst the chaos. So effective were these maps that the NGOs decided to basically start using them as well, uh, because they were more useful than uh, some of the information that they had. I next want to take you to East Africa. There's a village in Kenya called Lodariak that back when I wanted to be an anthropologist, when I first started in college, I spent a bunch of time in. Um, and I stayed with a family, I stayed specifically on a, uh, in a sort of hutted uh, home area with a man named Mze Ole Saidimu who had three wives and 32 children. Fascinating. Um, and when I first went to the village in the year 2000, no running water, no roads, no electricity, literally the middle of nowhere. It took days to get there. So I went back about two and a half years ago, still no running water, still no electricity, still no roads, still a huge pain to get there. Except one thing had changed. They all had mobile devices, all of them. Um, so the men had these knives that were on these beaded belts, and then they had a pouch for their knife, and then another pouch for their mobile device. The women had these beaded pouches over their necks, with a mobile device right inside of it. Um, so me being the sort of curious person that I was, my first question was, how do you plug it in? There's no electricity. Um, and so I thought this was a stupid question, but the answer was actually quite interesting. There's one guy in the village, um, he's probably you know, 21, 20 years old, who once a week collects all of the phones um, literally puts them in a sort of um, a USAID food relief sack, um, lugs them over his shoulder, um, you know, spends sort of several days getting to Nairobi, and then when he's in Nairobi, he finds a place where he uh, basically borrows a surge protector and plugs all the phones and just sits in the lobby all day charging them. He then turns, the, he, he, he then turns them off, he then goes back to the village, distributes all the phones again, and people have power for about a week. Okay, so then the next question is, what are these Maasai nomads doing? Well, it's quite interesting. Mze Ole Saidimu told me that in the past, when he wanted to sell goats and sheep, he had to guess which market to go to. 
Um, so he would walk literally in some cases 10 kilometers in one direction, six kilometers in another direction, trying to sort of basically guess where he was gonna get the best prices. Now he literally just calls his friend. He said business has never been better. Um, now what I find fascinating about this story, it's one example of many, but you can't get more remote than this village that I'm talking about. And what it means is connectivity and technology is spreading even in the most unlikely places. So when people tell you, well, there's still no electricity, or there's no 3G signal, or access, don't underestimate people because there's a fundamental observation that I've made, which is people do more with less. And there's no greater driver of innovation than necessity. And the more impoverished and lacking an infrastructure a society is, the more likely they are to teach us how to use the devices that we think we understand. The same logic that leads a kid in the village that I'm talking about to basically collect a bunch of garbage and make a toy out of it, or when you give them an old pair of sneakers, they come back looking brand new, is the same logic they apply to a mobile device. I've never read the instructions on any mobile device I've ever had. Um, you go to some of these troubled parts of the world and it's amazing how innovatively they use these devices. So even if the hardware, even if the technology is still innovated and still built in you know, the Silicon Valleys of the world, the ways in which we use it are gonna come out of the developing world. Another story I wanna tell you comes from Cuba, a place where I've been traveling you know, fairly recently. So Cuba has about 1% despite its proximity to Florida. Um, and it's prohibitively expensive. Um, so if you wanna use one of the government cyber cafes at your own peril, since they're all compromised, it's gonna cost you about 25% of your monthly salary. So basically you, you can't use it if you're an average Cuban citizen. So the Cuban citizens being the innovative uh, individuals that they are, have developed something that they call the sneaker net. And so the handful of people who have access to the internet or people who are traveling in and out of Cuba from, from abroad, they scrape content from the internet and store it on thumb drives and SD cards and other sort of small hardware devices. And then uh, citizens in Cuba subscribe to an illicit uh, distribution service where once a week, uh, these hardware, this hardware shows up in a little package on an image that I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, the police officers wear face masks. So when I, asked some of the, uh, when I asked some of the young people who are particularly tech savvy in Ciudad Juarez, if you see a crime, or if you're the victim of a crime, how do you feel comfortable reporting it to a police officer when they're not even willing to show their face? And they said, we're not. I said, well, then what do you do about it? They said, well, we used to do nothing, and then Ciudad Juarez got access to the internet, and now we use the internet as our face mask. And I asked what he meant by this. And what he said to me is, you know, we have the power of numbers, and what we actually wanna know is where the violence is happening, where we should avoid. We want to tell other people where the violence is happening and where they should avoid. So we basically started creating hashtags um, around incidents. And so you have all these bloggers and all these citizens who are basically crowdsourcing the drug cartel activity, crowdsourcing where the, the corrupt police officers are, naming and shaming corrupt police officers with hashtags, um, and they're basically using that to communicate with each other. Um, so what they always we have the power of numbers, the internet allows us the opportunity to be even more anonymous than the police who wear the face masks. Now the last story I wanna tell you is a particularly heart-wrenching one. Um, on the last trip that I took to Pakistan, I met a group of women who'd been attacked by the Taliban with acid. You hear a lot about this in Afghanistan, you don't hear about it as much in Pakistan where it's still quite in communities. And through no fault of their own, these women, the physical scars that they bear carry a terrible stigma in society that prevents them from getting employed, um, that leads to, to social and, and, and professional ridicule and just makes things quite difficult for them in the physical world. Um, so I met them at a compound where they all live together um, and I walked into the room and they were all sitting in a circle and um, you know, laughing and, and very charming and charismatic and I asked them, pardon you know, me if this is an offensive Given everything that's happened, um, how do you maintain your sense of humor? Um, how do you keep going? And she, held, she didn't even answer me with words, she held up her mobile device. And, and, and I asked her what, what, what she meant, and she said, ever since I got access to the internet, what I realized is I can live in a world where my scars are invisible. Where people judge me by the merit of what I'm saying. If I'm funny, I'm funny. Um, they can't see my scars online. Um, so this one woman that I was talking to, 
uh, told me how she'd met a man online. Uh, and they developed this online relationship and eventually agreed to meet. And he didn't know that she had been a, an acid attack victim. Um, and eventually they, they met in person um, and now they're married. So this is an extraordinary. I can go back to the facts and figures that I was throwing out at the beginning. I could tell you that you know, Pakistan has in 10 years gone from 300,000 mobile phones to you know, 125,000 mobile phones or is 25% internet penetrated. That doesn't tell you that story. That doesn't tell you how technology is transforming the individual lives of some of the most disenfranchised um, and, and, and abused demographics in the entire world. Um, you have to actually see these things firsthand. Extraordinary, I've just told you a handful of these stories, but what's amazing is I'm just getting caught up to the present. And I'm just telling you a handful of stories from a handful of countries that I've seen this firsthand in. It only begins to scratch the surface, right? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean that it's not having a tremendous impact. And there's such a hyper focus on some of the negative stories that we don't ne necessarily always pay attention to the heroes that are advocating for greater freedoms behind these digital iron curtains. The women's empowerment that is being ushered in as a result of technological empowerment. Um, the sort of ways that technology is allowing people to take security back into their own hands. And what's amazing is this is only the beginning. So you're going to have another four and a half to five billion people connect to the internet in the next decade. So most of the world is still not even connected yet. Um, now what's important to understand about this is, uh, according to Reporters Without Borders, two thirds of the world's population live in societies that are physically censored. Um, one out of every three people on Earth lives in a society that is severely censored. So what this means is most of the parts of the world that are coming online are actually still ridden with some of the greatest challenges. So we have a huge set of hurdles the good news is um, we can be prescient on this. Um, we know what those challenges are. We can begin to imagine the ways in which technology can be used to surmount them. But there's also tremendous innovations technologically that are on the horizon. So let me just sort of share a few of these that I'm particularly excited about. Uh, the first has to do with language. Um, near perfect voice recognition and translation technology and just the ubiquity of content in multiple languages online is going to allow for, you know, if Ambassador Crocker is, you know, wanting to talk to, uh, maybe this is a bad example since we know he speaks Arabic. If Ambassador Crocker wants to have a conversation in English with somebody who speaks Spanish, he'll be able to hold his phone to his ear. They'll be able to hold their phone to their ear. And in his tone, in, in the other person's tone and their accent, they'll have a simultaneously translated conversation as opposed to that weird robot voice that we sometimes hear when it's being automated. So the ability to communicate across cultures and languages, again, in your own tone, and to be able to choose which tone you want. Let's say that I want to have a conversation with an Iraqi friend of mine um, who Arabic, and I want it to sound like my mother-in-law. I could do that. Um, I could literally program it to sound like my mother-in-law. So we're, these things are really on the horizon. And it will just fuel unprecedented communications, which is good for mutual understanding and so forth. Medicine and health is another area where low-cost hardware and low-cost software, free software, are going to really change the game in terms of uh, how we can manage our own health. So imagine a situation where uh, you're walking down the street, um, and maybe you have a little cough and you don't feel well. Um, you reach into your pocket and you grab a smart pill. You then swallow that smart pill. It makes its way around your digestive system collect some data on what's going on, some analytics, Wi-Fi's it to your phone. Your, form, your phone performs a simple algorithm that comes to some kind of conclusion about what may or may not be wrong with you. Uh, looks at your phone to see what availability you have in your calendar, what insurance you take, and schedules a doctor's appointment for you. Right? Sounds kind of crazy, right? Maybe even science fiction. Did you know that in the last year, um, there's a pill that does exactly this awaiting FDA approval? So we're living in a world now where the things that used to be seen as science fiction um, are now within our grasp and reality. And what's amazing is it's very difficult to predict technologically happen within a decade. And what that means is it's getting harder to predict science fiction than it is reality. Um, it's actually difficult to think of things short of like going to Pluto um, that are going to just absolutely be impossible and are so sort of outside of the universe of likely. Um, but you think about how low cost some of these things are, um, and you might say, well, you know, how do you know the diagnosis? We're all sort of guilty of self-diagnosis from time to time. Um, you know, I mentioned this to, to actually somebody in the, the village that I told you about earlier, and they said, I would love to use this on my cows. <laughs> so that way I know which of my livestock gets sick. 
Think about artificial intelligence. Think about, you know, we have more veterans coming back uh, for, from combat than any time in, 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 in certainly many decades. Um, so you think about prosthetics. Um, and you think about what artificial intelligence can do. Obviously, there's nothing like the real thing, but we can get, we'll be able to get so close to, to full functionality, um, such that losing a limb, um, you know, basically doesn't, uh, uh, you know, create as many problems for, for, for somebody returning uh, from combat as it would pre-artificial intelligence. And then think about education. Most of the world's population still learns through rote memorization. So you have to ask yourself the question, what's new? Uh, so what's new is every school-aged child is going to have a low-cost smartphone in the palm of their hand, and they're going to be able to challenge rote memorization with informal learning. Entire apps ecosystems are going to emerge around providing supplements to you know, very poor educational systems in different parts of the globe. And then I'll give you one sort of fun example, since um, uh, you know, I think holography is always fun to talk about. You know, we're going to be able to be in at the same time. So I think about my wedding, and by the way, Fred, thank you for giving Zelda a shout out. I think that was very cool. Um, I think about my wedding. My grandparents, I got married in Italy. My grandparents were too old to, to be able to, to, to travel. The journey was too difficult for them. In the future, I would have been able to send them a holography box uh, they would put in their living room, and while we were dancing the horror on the dance floor, they would be able to holographically watch that whole experience play out in their living room. It's the ability to be in multiple places at the same time and share experiences with people through holography is also something extraordinary. And then neomorphic computing will so uh, computers can think more like humans. Um, so the average person um, will be able to just hire a virtual assistant that will be able to pick up on your tone and mannerisms and uh, it's much easier to sort of get mad at a robot than a person. Um, and really help us organize our lives. And these are just some of the things that we're going to see, but I could literally you know, bore you for an entire week with some of the marvelous technological innovations on the horizon. And these are not just elite enterprises, right? These things, you know, the whole industry is working tirelessly to get costs down, to get processing power down, to make these things not just more ubiquitous, but when they're actually ubiquitous, make sure that they're not prohibitively difficult for people to gain access to. Now, I'm painting a very optimistic picture for you, but I want to also sort of acknowledge that you know, technology has an empowerment bias. You know, it empowers people for, for good and for ill. And I mentioned that of the four and a half to five billion people who are going to be coming online in the next decade, um, these are some real geopolitical trouble spots. And I want to talk about the nexus between technology and some of those. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is ISIS certainly top of mind right now. You know, people often sort of, you've, you've heard people make remarks that, you know, if you want to know what social, what it would look like if social media existed in the seventh century, all you have to do is look at ISIS's activity. You know, we've never seen a terrorist organization simultaneously build their physical operations and their digital operations. And what ISIS seems to understand better than previous terrorist organizations is that it's as much about uh, you know, yes, it's about a charismatic leader, but perhaps it's about who your chief marketing officer is. It's about who your chief technology officer is. And ISIS, as a terrorist organization, has made sure that they've enlisted the right people with the right digital skill sets uh, to be able to expand their reach. So we haven't seen a terrorist organization with this kind of, with this kind of reach, which is why when you think about the 20,000 foreign fighters that are fighting in Iraq and Syria right now, a third of them come from Western Europe. Um, and of that third from Western Europe, roughly a third of those are, are, are recent converts. Um, so again, technology is sort of reach. But I think there's a lot of misperceptions about a, uh, giving technology more credit uh, than it actually deserves for what ISIS is doing. So um, you know, just because we, we often will say things like ISIS is, is, is unprecedentedly technologically savvy. The reality is they're actually not that tech savvy. They just use the technology a lot, and their content is really compelling. And there's a difference between somebody who's a good marketer with technology. I work with tech savvy people all day, every single day. Um, that's not ISIS. That, that's engineers at a, at a, at a company. Um, now, terrorist organizations have had 1,500 plus years to perform tactics in the physical world. That they've gotten to, a, you know, they're quite seasoned. You know, they sort of have best practices. They've had single digit years to figure out how to use technology. And the reality is that it as we think they are. Um, and it's actually more of a vulnerability for them than it is an asset. That might seem counterintuitive to, to, to you, so let me, let, me, let me explain my logic behind this. Let's think back to even five to seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer. 
you know, we have to remember the situation we were in before, where a lot of these organizations were operating out of caves and back alley religious madrasas, completely off the grid, where the opportunity for counter narratives, the opportunity to break up attacks, the opportunity to sort of interject in the radicalization process, we, we, we had fewer options. Now it's very difficult to imagine a terrorist of the future operating out of a cave in Tora Bora and being even remotely relevant. So what that means is terrorists of the future are gonna have to opt in to technology or even terrorists of the present. Now, by my calculation, there's a long history or tradition of terrorists being young, and there's an even longer tradition of young people doing stupid things and making mistakes. So add technology into the equation and those mistakes get captured in data permanence. So what it means is terrorists using the internet, if terrorists are online, the for error goes down significantly. Um, if you think about it, Terrorists, just like non-terrorists, are splitting their time between the physical and the digital worlds. And all they have to do is make one mistake. They can unravel their entire plans, they can you know, cause their entire network to become unraveled. So there's a huge number of uh, ISIS, uh, or aspiring ISIS fighters who are actually getting caught because a family member, a friend, an acquaintance sees something that they say or post on social media. Um, so it's actually a vulnerability. You know, it, it, it's much dif more difficult when these guys are completely off the grid. And there's a fantastic story that I think really illustrates this. It's not about terrorism, but about criminality. A few years ago, there was a $45 million ATM heist that took place in about eight hours. It was basically fueled by roughly, I think, 15,000 plus transactions across 40 plus countries. Um, now, the whole thing was orchestrated by a transnational criminal ring that was pretty good at staying off the grid. But they, st they still needed just sort of people to actually go to the ATM machines and take out the cash. And they needed a lot of them. So they turned to just your average street criminal. Now it turns out street criminals aren't the smartest people in the entire world. So what happened? Uh, not one of them, not two of them, not a dozen of them, but several dozen of them took the cash out of the ATM machines and then posted pictures of themselves celebrating with the cash on Instagram not realizing that Instagram geolocates by default. Um, now the beauty of geolocation is it's very easy for law enforcement to then find people. Um, and so they're able to find these street criminals. Um, they were able to sort of work backwards, figure out who they were interacting with, and ultimately figure out who the sort of ringleaders were of this entire operation. Unfortunately, when they found the ultimate ringleader, he was already dead in the Dominican Republic, but that doesn't change, which again, you know, Terrorists and criminals, by virtue of being young, by virtue of often sort of doing things differently in their social worlds than their professional worlds, and by virtue of the fact that they're constantly on the run and always fugitives, means at some point they make a mistake. And that's where technology becomes really valuable in the fight against violent extremism. Not to mention the fact that if what they're trying to do is recruit online and spread their propaganda online, Last time I checked, the number of people in the internet ecosystem that are against violent extremism is significantly larger than, that, 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 than those that practice it. Uh, we just haven't found a way to mobilize it. So one of the things that the technology industry is starting to think about is against ISIS, such that every time you know, there's a pro-ISIS argument online, it's met with a tsunami of anti-ISIS arguments and counter arguments. So you know, the, the industry is starting to try to make more sense of this. And then you know, the industry also works very hard to, to get content that violates its policies taken offline. So last year, uh, YouTube removed 14 million videos um, that had been posted online promoting gratuitous violence or terrorism um, and violated our policy. So the industry has gotten very good, algorithmically speaking, at doing this and doing it quickly. I want to talk a little bit about revolutions and civil wars because that's something that we've seen a lot of uh, in the last decade, um, you know, obviously throughout history, but the, the technological component of it is, is what's new. I'll first say a few things about revolutions. Um, you know, we all know the story of the Arab Spring, but what's the real story as it pertains to technology? Well, to me, the real lesson that comes out of the Arab Spring is that we should understand that in an age of technology, revolutions will be easier to start, but they'll be harder to finish. And the reason they'll be easier to start is it's very easy for large numbers of people with mobile devices to all organize around the lowest common denominator, which is typically how do we get one dictator out of power, mobilize into the streets, and then after that nobody agrees on anything. And because of the accelerated pace that comes as a result of technology, one of the challenges that we're seeing in the spring, Middle East and North Africa, is a, we're, we're literally seeing this accelerated pace of movement making retard leadership development. 
So it used to be that you would spend decades becoming a leader. You think about the you know, Lequel Lesses of the world, the Mandelas of the world, the Charles of the world. You know, only later did they become celebrities and public figures. Now we've reversed it, which is a lot of these revolutions produced flash in the pan celebrities, but no new leaders with new last names who could sort of run for president, you know, figure out a new system of government and, and lead their country forward. So there's a real leadership crisis that's existing in the context of these revolutions. And then also technology raises expectations. So because large numbers of people can get into the street and have tremendous success at unseating somebody that has been in power for 30 years in a matter of days, they expect the pace of change in their society to happen just as fast. And it comes into, you know, ultimately with some of the realities on the ground, which is that there's no institutions, there's no leaders, as I mentioned. Um, and at the end of the day, there's no sort of viable system of government uh, you know, because there's no institutions. And then on civil war, you look at Syria. Syria, to me, is the very first civil war where you simultaneously have a cyber civil war taking place. And we, of course, know the story of the civil war there and the um, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people who've been killed and the chemical weapons that have been used. But let me tell you a different side of this. Right? Again, th there's one civil war in Syria. Um, it just has a physical front and a digital front. And what's interesting is the Syrian electronic army um, is actually recruiting digital foreign fighters, often from the former Soviet Union. And they're asking those digital foreign fighters to come fight on behalf of the Syrian army, but telling them they don't need to leave their home countries. Because the reach of technology allows them to basically fight on behalf of this electronic army without having to physically travel to Syria. So what are some of the consequences of this? Well, I spent a bunch of time in Syria in 2005 and 2006. And I saw a group of friends of mine that I hadn't uh, basically since that trip um, roughly a year and a half ago um, when I went up to the, the, the border between Lebanon and Syria and they came across uh, into Lebanon. And I asked them to tell me a little bit about what's happening and I specifically asked them about the cyber threat, expecting them to say, oh, that's not really a big deal or that doesn't really impact us. And they told me this horrible story um, so the government has set up all these checkpoints throughout the major cities, Damascus, Homs, et cetera. Um, and they told me that they've started setting up these checkpoints that the young people have started calling social media checkpoints. They have different, different names for them. And my friend told me that she and her brother got stopped at one of them. And the first thing they did was they asked them for their phones. Um, for their phones. And they said, what's your Facebook password? Um, they said, we, we don't want to tell you. So then they threatened them. It's pretty easy to keep up their password. Um, and then uh, my friend's brother uh, hadn't actually posted something on his, his wall, um, but a friend or somebody had posted the person at the checkpoint deemed sympathetic to the revolution. So at that point, a signal came from the checkpoint up to a rooftop where a sniper then shot my friend's brother in the head. Amazingly, he survived. Um, but that's a story where you know, it's not just about getting caught in the physical crossfire. Every single Syrian who has access to the internet, who has access to a mobile device, is also caught in a digital crossfire. And to treat cyberspace and the physical world as two separate universes, when in actuality they're in the same world, is to sort of miss the point that what happens in one impacts the other and they can spill over into each other. So this is what you're seeing. You're seeing Syria spill over into a digital domain, which means that even people who are sitting at home, bored and not able to leave their house all day, even they're not safe, it's a question of how aware are they of it. Now, I heard another story from uh, a young man who was in the chemical weapons attack in Ghouta in Syria in August of 2013, who said one of the challenges they've had in Syria is they don't know what platforms are safe to use. You know, is it safe to use WhatsApp? Is it safe to use Skype? Is it safe to use email? They don't know. So what they literally did was they asked for young volunteers to go out and use different platforms and deliberately say provocative things to see what happens said literally young Syrians have lost their lives trying to help other Syrians know what platforms they should use and not use. To know that they should use Skype instead of WhatsApp. To know they should use this browser and not that browser. And it's sort of, it's a whole new dimension of civil war that, 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 that didn't exist a decade ago. Um, and this is going to be the case for every single civil war going forward. It's always going to have a, a digital dimension to it. Now I want to talk a little bit about China. Because you know, a question that people often ask is, you have 1.4 billion people there, um, you know, a country that has seemed to master um, the uh, art of uh, digital censorship. You know, to the extent that there's a country that has 
effectively built a digital iron curtain with, you know, within, uh, within cyberspace, it's certainly China. So the question is, you know, what does all this mean? How well do they fare and so forth? Um, on my last trip to China, I met with a group of intellectuals and I asked them about the viability of the system. To us, the formula in China is very simple. People don't expect their government to be honest. Um, they don't expect their government to be anything but corrupt, but they do expect their economy to grow. And if the economy ceases to grow at north of 7.2%, or if per capita GDP does not double, um, they said that they start to ask questions. And so they said with technology, even though the government is censoring, you know, they're able to poke holes in the, wall, in the firewall in ways that you couldn't with the Berlin Wall that allows them to at least agitate a little bit. It's just a question of, 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 of how much. Um, now, nobody really knows what happens with the sort of China experiment because you're gonna have a billion Chinese citizens come online in the next decade. It will happen one time in one country and it'll never happen again. Be the largest and most voluminous example of digital urbanization that the entire world has ever seen in the sense that 70% of the country is still rural, but as they come online, they're gonna be digitally urban meaning they're gonna have access to the same marketplace of ideas as people living in Beijing and Shanghai and so forth. And even the Chinese themselves don't know what that looks like. So it's important to understand why the Chinese engage in nefarious cyber activity. Why do they censor their population? Why, do they, why does the government steal intellectual property? Um, uh, why do they conduct cyber attacks on companies, uh, you know, NGOs and, and governments and other entities? People often assume that the primary motivation behind China's nefarious cyber activity is repression of its population. That's part of it, but the government in Beijing you know, feels like they've got that largely under control. A lot of it is driven by capitalism. I was saying at lunch today that it's a sort of modern version of digital protectionism. Um, you know, the best way to ensure um, companies do well in your country is to make sure the competitors don't do well. That's part of it. Uh, part of it is that they want to build out the world's technological infrastructure. Um, so while a lot of Western countries are building physical highways, the Chinese are build it, busy building digital highways across Sub-Saharan Africa, across Latin America, across Asia. Um, think about it, most of the uh, are not connected to the internet are autocratic governments. Um, they're happy to have um, the Chinese government helped them transition from a physical autocracy to a digital autocracy that has some of the tools of state-sponsored that the Chinese are happy to sell to them. Um, and there's some interesting dynamics happening. So in the same way that during uh, there was sort of an arms, uh, you know, arms trade for natural resources, you see a similar thing playing out in today's world where you have countries like China that have the surveillance technology basically trading it with aut autocratic countries that have oil and natural resources. So it's a whole sort of modern day, you know, arms trade except it's surveillance technology instead of, um, you know, weapons in the, in the traditional sense. Now, the other thing that I'll, I'll, I'll mention about China um, in terms of the sustainability of the system is, um, you know, a lot of people sort of ask the question, um, what will poke such uh, uh, significant holes in the Chinese firewall that ultimately it won't be relevant? Now, the way that we've typically thought about tearing down repressive walls is political solutions, because um, that's what we had in the past. Our walls, political solutions aren't gonna work. It'd be very difficult to convince, you know, Beijing or any other repressive government to basically stop censorship tactics online. They're, they're just not incentivized to do it. Um, what's interesting and what's new is differently from physical walls, walls, firewalls have engineering solutions. So what you have is the private sector and NGOs and just entrepreneurs busy working on technical solutions to firewall challenges. Um, so you know, go back to what I said at the beginning that the pace of innovation is such that the average citizen can now play a huge role in shaping what the future looks like. It means that a kid in their garage in San Francisco um, can help deal with the problem of repressive firewalls popping up in different repressive countries around the world. Now I do think I need to talk about the impact of Edward Snowden on the intelligence community um, and just national security in general. Uh, you know, we're sort of, you know, the, the Snowden, you know, uh, you know, revelations produce catastrophic consequences. The question is where is all of this going? I think it's always important to ask the question what's new. So what's new about the Snowden revelations is the ability for individuals to leak classified documents in bulk. You know, this notion of being able to leak millions of documents was not something that was possible in the past. The other thing that's new is the ability to do it remotely. 
Um, so you know, he didn't you know, smuggle it out in his pants or a suitcase. He was able to do a series of very complicated technical digital drops from other countries. The other thing that's new, because you can leak remotely, um, you have the celebrity effect. So there was actually a study done on Edward Snowden's approval ratings um, internationally, and there's a steady increase in them uh, over time. So you know, a leaker was caught uh, immediately, and they didn't have an opportunity to shape public opinion to themselves. And what's particularly dangerous about this is it fuels copycatting. Um, now, we spend a lot of time talking about the impact of Edward Snowden, and not a lot of time spent thinking about, you know, what happens the next time this happens, right? We, we thought, uh, you know, WikiLeaks and Assange was a problem, and this was an even larger problem. So then the question is, what's next? You know, what we learn is it's not just about governments. You know, corporations are going to have their Snowden moments as well. You know, just the, the, the notion of, of individuals having access to large um, amounts of information mean that, you know, uh, companies uh, have to basically proactively start to think about how they safeguard themselves against these types of internal leaks. Um, but what's happened is it's made collecting intelligence more difficult. Um, it's, uh, made, uh, it's made the notion of keeping a secret more difficult. It, it sort of created a deterrence um, against a lot of the things that the intelligence community needs in order to be effective. So it's a huge challenge. And I think the IC will, 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 will navigate it, but I think it's going to be a very rocky decade. Um, then one of the last points I want to make is with regards to the future of the Internet in general. So as I mentioned, in a decade, the entire world is going to be online. Um, so I'm going to paint a scenario for you of something that I think we are sort of well underway in terms of happening, but there's still moments for, for intervention, which is you know, as countries go from a minority of their population being online to their entire population being on my, online, states are going to realize that as hard as it is to implement laws in the physical world, it's even more difficult to implement those laws in cyberspace, especially when cyberspace is the world's largest ungoverned space. So the natural reaction of states as they sort of try to avoid relinquishing control and power due to the um, uh, societies coming online is they're going to balkanize the internet. So what do I mean by balkanize the internet? I literally mean filtering out content so that the internet looks and reflects the norms and values and laws of the physical world. Um, and this happens at three levels already today. So you have politically acceptable organizations. So that's like the US and Germany. So you know, they have, they're, they're both democracies, but they have nuanced difference of opinion in terms of free speech. So in Germany, you won't be able to find any content online promoting neo-Nazi hate speech. In the United States, you will. Companies filter out that content in accordance with German law. So that's sort of in the category of politically acceptable. Then you have a second category that we call the sheepish. And I would put Turkey in this category. Um, I would put Russia in this category, although they're starting to teeter into the, the one that I'll mention shortly, which is um, you know, we will filter like crazy and do politically motivated censorship, but we'll couch it all as child safety. So you know, in the case of Turkey, you know, child safety is about suppressing Kurdish content. Um, or in the case of Russia, you know, because we're so concerned about the children, uh, we need to censor Alexei Navalny's blog. You know, it's, it's, it's that type of um, sort of caginess. And then, of course, the third is the blatant, which is China, Iran, the countries that are sort of, um, you know, they're, 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 they're fairly transparent about the fact that they're doing it and, and don't seem to really care much. So it's already underway. So what does balkanization of the internet actually fuel? So, Today, we think of it in terms of individual internet Balkans that reflect the norms, values, and laws of a state. The direction that this could go in is you can imagine a situation where like-minded states band together to collectively edit the web. So imagine a situation where a group of um, Sunni countries uh, with particularly strict conservative laws um, all agree to filter out certain content. Um, and do so as an alliance. Or imagine six countries that are particularly fond of their uh, founding father and don't like their founding father being criticized all enter into a founding father alliance where they agree to filter out any negative content about founding fathers. Um, or you could imagine a situation in the extreme sense um, you have a group of states getting together to commit digital ethnic cleansing. Um, so what do I mean by this? Imagine a situation where Iran basically decides they're going to wipe the Kurds off the web. They're going to filter out any Kurdish content. They're going to attack. They're going to uh, knock any Kurdish websites offline. Um, they're going to infect Kurdish computers with malware, and they're going to just make it all look like technical difficulties. 
um, technologically, these sorts of things are possible. Um, so you know, we have to do everything that we can to of the internet because the next phase of balkanization is the formation of alliances that can lead to really catastrophic things which will ultimately destroy the health of the internet and create huge impediments to, to, to progress online. So I want to conclude with um, the, the question that I asked at the, 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 the beginning, which is, or the question I referred to at the beginning, which is, um, you know, to the extent that certain countries around the world are attempting to erect a digital iron curtain that is preventing their populations to gaining access to the free and open internet, how will these countries fare? Well, I think that, you know, it's, it, like all things, it'll be a cat and mouse game, but I actually think that the future is gonna be quite difficult for autocracies, at least in the digital sense. To begin with, um, we should distinguish between totalitarian societies and your run-of-the-mill autocratic societies. With the exception of countries like North Korea, Eritrea, and to some extent Cuba, there's not really that many totalitarian societies left in the world. Um, and I actually think in large part that's because of the internet. You know, you really have to not let any technology in in the first place in order to basically create a culture where there's no doubt, a cult of personality. And I think in many respects the internet has begun the process or almost completed the process of eliminating extreme totalitarianism in the same way that a particular type of medicine was able to eliminate smallpox. Um, but autocracies will still remain and they'll sustain in the future. But here's where their vulnerability is. So let me ask all of you a question. How many of you by show of hands have multiple email accounts? Seems like everybody. How many of you have multiple phone numbers? How many of you use multiple social networking profiles? Basically everybody for all three questions. So I could ask more questions, but what I've illustrated there is every person who raised their hand is one physical human being. Two of how many times you raise your hand, you basically have multiple personalities online. Each of you has a virtual entourage and you're proliferating identities of yourself. And by the way, those identities are not all the same. Maybe you use one email account for work, so your tone is a little more professional, you're a little bit nicer, one's for your social life, so maybe you're a little bit more obnoxious and uncouth. Uh, maybe you have a rogue identity. Um, you know, it sort of depends. Um, but the reality is, in the future, the physical individual punch way above his or her physical weight. Um, and that's an extraordinary advantage for citizens vis-a-vis -vis regimes. So let's take a country like Iran. Iran is a country of roughly 80 million physical people, one of the fastest growing internet markets in the entire Middle East. In a decade, the entire 80 million people will be online, and by then it'll probably be 90 or 100 million people. If every single one of those people has multiple email accounts, multiple social networking profiles, multiple phone numbers, then all of a sudden, if you're the regime in Tehran, your population of 80, 90, 100 million people looks more like a population of a billion people. So the dictator's dilemma of the future is how do you distinguish between what's real and what's noise? How do you know if what seems like a revolution of millions of people is in fact 500 people looking like a million people? or 500 people with a million online identities. Herein lies a major dilemma. And for the dictator, where they overreact to something that is small and looks large is where they'll miscalculate, and where they underreact to something um, that they assume is just a bunch of identities and is actually physically small is where they're gonna miss a revolution. And so that miscalculation is the vulnerability. Now I'll conclude with something that I think is so important for what the leadership school here is doing, which is, you know, ultimately in the, in the future, I believe that human beings and computers will split duties according to what they're both good at, right? So computers are good at needle and haystack problems. Human beings are good at the judgment, emotion. And at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot that technology can do, right? You know, technology can help us proliferate identities. Technology can create vulnerabilities. It can pierce through repressive firewalls. But technology can create leaders. Um, technology can help find leaders in a crowd the best solution to a better world in the future is still very analog, which is leaders um, who have the skill sets and leadership to drive their countries forward. Um, technology will be part of that socialization process. Technology will be part of that toolkit, but ultimately it's efforts like the one here at the leadership school that are gonna be the most important. Um, without real leaders, everything that I'm talking about you know, is nice, but at the end of the day, it'll just be a missed opportunity. Um, so I'm really grateful to have had the time to be here. I hope I've given you uh, some interesting things to think about. As I mentioned, you know, President Bush, Mrs. Bush, this is really one of life's great honors to be able to be here uh, amongst one of history's great uh, first couples. And it's really an honor and a privilege. So thank you very much.
the obligatory. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. That was thought-provoking indeed. Fabulous presentation. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. A little gift from us uh, to remember your visit here to the George Bush Presidential Library Center. Thank you very much. <laughs>